I'm Lee Bardugo, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lee Bardugo. It's episode 244 and the start to another great week podcast. Before we get into today's interview with Lee Bardugo, I'd like to thank our sponsors. If you would like to sponsor the show and highlight your product or service to our audience, go to hankgarner.com and click on the advertise link in the top menu. Thanks to Daniel Arthur Smith and Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. This 19th issue of Tales from the Canyons of the Damned consists of five sharp, suspenseful, thought-provoking short stories, each from a different featured master of speculative fiction. Pick up the Halloween edition today. The Future Chronicles by curator and publisher Samuel Peralta. The Future Chronicles has grown from a single collection of robot stories into a series whose unique take on major science fiction and fantasy themes, AI, aliens, time travel, dragons, telepaths, zombies, immortality, galactic battles, cyborgs, doomsday, has made it one of the most acclaimed short story anthology series of the digital era. Pick up something from the Future Chronicles today. Third Scribe is a web platform built to serve all members of the book community, readers, authors, and publishers. Third Scribe can help you get the most out of your publishing and reading experience. Connecting readers and writers, give thirdscribe.com a look today. From book one of the Paragons trilogy by C. Stephen Manley, When Dark Portals Open, Heroes Will Awaken. Israel Trin is a man living his dream as a crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Aaron Sims is a young woman whose life is a blur of neon lights, drug-fueled diversions, and being in the wrong places with the wrong people. These two strangers wake up together in a modern-day dungeon with no memory of how they got there and come face-to-face with monsters that neither ever dreamed existed. Rescued by agents of the mysterious Sentry Group, the duo soon find their lives turned upside down. Awakened is the first book of the Paragons trilogy. It's a gripping origin story filled with mystery, fast-paced action, horrific threats, and bewildering fringe science. If you enjoy an action thriller with a heavy dose of the fantastic, you'll love C. Stephen Manley's Awakened. Essence, book one, Septima, series by Nick Breaker. Troy, with his irrational fears, is the least likely person to lead a war, but that doesn't mean he can escape his destiny. A trip to New Orleans turns into something much larger when aliens kidnap him and his friends. A perfect doppelganger for their dead General Tomas, Troy is thrust into the front lines of battle against Reptarn invaders. As he struggles to maintain control of his own destiny, Troy knows that no matter the outcome, his life will never be the same. Explore the mind of this unlikely hero in essence, the first book in a new sci-fi series by Nick Breaker, a coming-of-age tale full of adventure and steamy encounters. Pick up Essence, book one by Nick Breaker today. Music City Macabre by Bob Williams is some of the best action, adventure, horror you'll ever read. Music City will never be the same as you have a front row seat for the end of the world. Give this series a look today, Music City Macabre by Bob Williams. Stay tuned after the show for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to bring you an interview with Lee Bardugo, whose brand new book is called The Language of Thorns, Midnight Tales, and Dangerous Magic. Y'all, this book is so gorgeous. Uh, I posted a video on on Instagram uh, a week or two back when I got this book, and I was just thumbing through the pages and showing the immaculate artwork in here and uh you know if you can get past all the beautiful uh presentation of the book and actually get to the words uh <laughs> it is it is a fantastic book uh, on all fronts uh, so i'm really excited to have you on the show today lee welcome thank you so much hank it's nice to be here uh, lee i begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller Oh my gosh, that is deep stuff. Um, <laughs> well, we I go mean, straight for the juggler. <laughs> I know, right? Um, I mean, I can tell you that 
I was an only child, and so, and we lived、um, in this part of the valley where there were no sidewalks. Like we kind of lived up on this hill, so you couldn't really even walk around the neighborhood.、Um, so I spent a lot of time literally walking in circles、um, at the top of our driveway and、uh, making up stories. Usually about having like six sisters and seven brothers and living in a hayloft or you know having a pet dragon and that was re- that's really my earliest memory is of keeping myself entertained by telling myself stories. Nice.、Uh, which valley、uh, were you living in? Oh, the San Fernando Valley. It's not a very it's not a very scenic valley, but <laughs>、uh, yeah, I grew up. <laughs> I grew up in、uh, Sherman Oaks and Encino before they were bougie. So,、yeah. oh, nice, nice.、Um, but you were not born there, were you? No, I was born in Jerusalem. But、um, my mom and I came here. Her family was、uh, from California, and we came back here when I was just two months old. So, effectively, I, I have spent my whole life in,、uh, grew up in Los Angeles. Gotcha, gotcha. So the.、Um, You know the the childhood storytelling and the、uh, entertaining、uh, yourself by by making up other characters to surround yourself with. You know that's a that's a pretty common thing for a lot、uh, a lot of people that that go on to be writers and artistic people、uh, in general. Were you、uh, were you fascinated by books? Did other stories capture your imagination early on? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, again, I was an only child. Um, we lived in a somewhat isolated area, so I was constantly reading, and I mean, I was watching TV too. You know, I had Scooby Doo and the、sure. Transformers to keep me keep me company, but、um, I read a lot.、Um, I think that I think the switch sort of flipped for me when I hit junior high.、Um, I had always written stories and poems, and you know, drawn little made storybooks and drawn pictures for them and that kind of thing. And it was, but when I went to junior high, we moved. You know, we moved to a completely different part of town.、Um, my mom remarried. I started a new school,、uh, and it was really like my life had this very sharp break in it. And I remember arriving at this at this junior high school and feeling like I had crash landed on an alien planet. Like I, we did not. I did not speak the same language effectively as everybody around me. I did not understand the rules that we were all playing by. All of a sudden. And、um, that was also when I really when I got into、um, science fiction and fantasy,、um, and I think that's when my writing changed. And I think also writing became kind of a, a survival mechanism at that point、um, because life was pretty rough at home and pretty rough at school, and this was a way of occupying a different space. But that's also when I started consuming stuff like Frank Herbert and Isaac Asimov and、um, Neil Gaiman, you know, in in copious amounts. Yeah, I, I'm shaking my head. Yes, because、uh, I can completely relate with that.、Um, yeah, yeah that, Gaiman, especially when I discovered Neil Gaiman, I feel like my life changed, and, and that's such a、uh, cliche thing to say. But、uh, I, I don't know. He 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 told these weird stories that made the weird stories I made up seem perfectly plausible, <laughs> and you know, and、uh, a, a new way of looking at the world.、Um, I've always been fascinated with kind of the world behind the world, and you know what, you know the world is could really be a magic place if we could kind of peel the layers back and see what was really going on behind there. You know, it's just a it's a fun imagination, especially if you're an awkward kid、uh, who doesn't quite fit in, or is you know maybe、uh, ahead of your time or behind your time or, or whatever it is. Those those stories really take root. I think for me. You know, I think sort of the seminal work of my youth was probably Dune, because、yeah. it's not just that it presented a different world; it presented a world that had a different set of values.、Um, you know, that where being prepared and smart and、um, and brave was more important than being cute or、uh, cheerful. Which was, you know, as somebody who had just been tossed into this world of like volleyball blondness, I was like, <laughs> "This is. I need to believe that there's a place where the things I can do and the things I care about will will matter." And I think that was sort of the promise of a lot of science fiction and fantasy for me. And also that, you know, these are. I, I think that these books for me, you know, I, I think it's easy to write off. 
these books as escapism. But like you said, I think that I think it's sort of a privilege that science fiction and fantasy fans have where we never lose that feeling that there's something more happening in the, in the world, that you could open the door to Narnia at any time, that there's always a monster living under the bridge. You know, I never want to lose that feeling. And my favorite stories are the ones that kind of pierce that veil. Yeah, and, and science fiction and fantasy, uh, like you said, uh, allow us to to kind of see the world in more uh, – you know, the, the world we live in is very gray. And sometimes in science fiction and fantasy, the, the, uh, truth is a, is a value to strive for and bravery. And the good guys are good and the bad guys are bad. And, and of course, some – there are lots of different subgenres that, that – you know, kind of mix those things, but you know, it kind of, well, it, but it, I would, I would actually say, I want to, I'm actually yeah, going to jump in go here ahead. and say that I think one of the gifts that sci-fi and fantasy gave me was thinking beyond the good guys are good and the bad guys are bad. You know, I think that obviously in a lot of um, classic works of the genre, sure. That's, that's where that dividing line lies. Yeah, yeah. But I think in my favorite books, you know, there were always, there were sort of other questions that were being asked. And I'm thinking even of like Rob Robots and Empire, but also Howl's Moving Castle. And, you know, there were a lot of books that for me were asking questions that other stories weren't asking. You know, like the, the what was on offer for me was were stories I felt completely alienated from. You know, I, the people love to talk about the darkness in young adult books and how dangerous it is and kids reading about these horrible things and what does it say? But the truth is, like, that's nothing compared to Sweet Valley High. Like, you know, reading about, like, these two girls who had an adorable red Fiat and went on these dates and lived this, I was like, who is this? And, it, you know, it was set in California, too. And I felt like that's what I was being presented with. And then on the other side of that were kind of, like, the issue books that were going to be all about, like, the deep misery of being a teenager and having an eating disorder and having, you know, and, and cutting and all this. Sh- Can I swear on this? Podcast? Uh, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, all of this bullshit where it's like, yes, those were things that were happening, but they weren't everything that were happening. And the idea of being trapped, I mean, it felt unbelievably claustrophobic and distancing at the same time to read these things. Like, I was already in a situation where the only life I had was home, the school, uh, home school and the mall when I could get there, right? And, and I needed the world to expand. You know, science fiction and fantasy is not just about escapism. All writing is about escapism. Even nonfiction is a kind of escapism because you're leaving your world when you enter the page. But the idea of expanding the world and of seeing something bigger than what I could occupy at that time was just invaluable. Uh, I, I really don't know what I would have done without genre at that time. Uh, did uh, did any of your peers uh, share the same love of, of genre fiction that you did? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Looking back, you know, I didn't really have like I didn't have like a community. I didn't have I wasn't really online, you know, and I didn't have like a like a D and D group. Like I didn't have anything like that. Um, the closest I got was um, like around like ninth grade. Um, I became friends with this kid, Josh, and he was really into the Dragonlance books, which, um, so I read like, I don't know, like 30 of them. I read so many of those books. And we <laughs> In a to, weekend? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like it was one of those things where I was like, well, yes, there's more. Um, and so we, you know, and we would call each other Lorana and Brightblade and, um, nice, and, nice. and actually still do. Um, and there was, uh, well, I was really into Highlander. Like we were both really into <laughs> I was the time like you can I have very sophisticated taste but um but things like you know I remember reading a ton of Stephen King for instance and but it wasn't like you talked about it like the book culture that exists now really did not exist for me as a kid I did not have that kind of community at all um yeah I've never even been in book club maybe that's why i like going to conventions so much because i like being on a panel and actually getting to talk about these books we all love right i i wrote a blog post a while back about uh, how uh, a copy of dragon riders of pern uh nearly mm. got me into a fist fight at school yes yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I can relate i can relate um at what point lee did you uh realize that this love of of genre fiction was going to turn into more uh than just fan fascination um, wow. That is, again, that's a hard thing to pinpoint. I feel like anything I say is going to be sort of reductive. But um, yeah, I, 
I mean, I wanted to be a writer from the time I was a kid. That was sort of what I wanted to do. But I had this problem where I could not get past the writing of the really the first act of the book like I'm like the first act is always really fun right because that's when you're, you're introducing characters and you're throwing open doors and then you really sink into the meat of the story you know that's the second act is the bulk of the book and I at the time I didn't know even I didn't even know about three act structure so I would have all this momentum and excitement about writing and then I would just hit a wall and I didn't know how to get past that so I think for me it wasn't about deciding to become a writer. It was about learning how, what my process was and how to be a writer. And also sort of stepping away from all of the myths that I had absorbed about creativity and being a creative person through media. Uh, what was the first story uh, that you wrote that you knew was going to, uh, to be something special and that was going to, uh, to find an audience because, you know, I think we, uh, most writers write a lot of stuff that'll never see the light of day and thank God that it won't. Um, you know, that's what desk drawers are for. And, Mm. uh, but, but, you know, uh, there comes a point where a story idea comes to you and you're like, okay, this is the thing that's, uh, that that is is going to uh be bigger than i am no (laughs) i'm gonna disagree on that i'm gonna disagree i think that's actually a really dangerous way to think i think that's the romance that's the romance of the big idea right we love this we love the we love this to me and look you know everybody is different everybody's process is different so i'm not trying to shut that down but i think i grew up with this idea that you that you would that you fall in love with the idea like you see the big idea from across the room and you're like yes this is the one I've been waiting for. This is the sexiest, best idea. And this is this is the idea I can commit to. And th- this is going to be it. Th- this is going to be the one that makes me. And I don't, I think that's dangerous because we all fall in, we fall in love with many ideas and they all seem spectacular at the beginning. And the process of writing a book is not about falling in love. It's about staying in love. It's about that initial moment of inspiration moving to, you know, a, a hundred moments, thousands of moments of daily inspiration. And the days when you are out of love, when you've stopped being interested in that idea, when it's not sexy anymore and where you see other ideas and you're like, oh, this idea looks good, smells good. Yes. Like this is this is the better idea. This is the one everyone will want to read. Um, really, then going back and staying in the one that you're struggling with and making it through that first thorny, terrible, messy first draft. Um, you know, that that to me, I think, is really more a, a, the way that I have come to look at ideas. You know, there are, I do think that we can distinguish the ones, the, the ideas that keep us up at night, that ask a million questions right away, as opposed to the ones that just seem kind of cool and go into the idea file. But for me, you know, again, this was not about I started many books that maybe could have been great books if they had had the chance to live for longer, to live past the first act. But with my first book, Shadow and Bone, I don't think it was that the idea was so brilliant. I think it was that I decided to see it through. And I, it was the first book I wrote, tried to write with an outline. And um, honestly, it was the first book that I finished. I think you know, in some ways that is difficult for me because I think I'm a very different writer now, even five years on than I was when I wrote that novel. Um, and so I guess it's longer than that, seven years at this point. Um, but, uh, but, and so there was a certain amount of learning on the job. Um, but that book, I, I, when I set out to write it, I said, just write a bad draft write, write this, this isn't a great idea, just write the idea and just get it done. And then once it's done, you'll be able to write another one. You need to prove to yourself that you can actually finish a damn book. And then at the end of that first messy, horrible first draft, I thought, actually, there's some stuff in here I really like, and maybe there's more here than I realized. So then it was going back in and refining it and trying to make it something good and something that I felt good about. Um, but it's not like in that time I, I, you know, I hoped that people would find their way to it, but there was certainly no surety in me that they would. 
that's actually one of the most beautiful things I've I've ever heard on this podcast. Uh, that I, I'm, yes, I know that's good. I, you know, I'm not trying to be corny, but that's uh, that I, I love the. I mean, you're, you're talking about marriage there. You know, uh, my yeah. my wife and I were uh, were actually doing this survey for our niece who's in college, and uh, and she wanted to survey some couples. Uh, you know, that've been married a long time, and we've been together almost 25 years, and yeah. and so these are some of the same things we're talking about. Is that you know when you fall in love it's all mushy and and all that but then you know the feelings go away and then you have to actually work at being married yeah. and it's the same thing for a writer and you're one of the few people that have ever been brave enough to to say that and to put it that way <laughs> and i i love that um so i'm the, the real hero here thank you <laughs> yes 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 everyone a round of applause for lead yes. um so you know, and, and this is where, it, this is where it gets really hard because you have to trust yourself as a writer yeah. that, uh, that, you know, I had a, a good idea, uh, maybe even inspired, who knows, you know, if you want to use that kind of language or not. And, uh, and now can I do something with this when it gets hard? Uh, wh what do you do as a writer when the, you know, cause most everybody can write a phenomenal first chapter. A lot of us can even write a great first act, but yeah. after that, when you get into the to the murkiness, you know, the middle section of the book, right. and we may even be able to land it on in, in at the end of the third act. But you know, what uh, what tools do you use as a writer when it gets hard and when you don't think the book is any good? How do you uh, how do you see yourself through it? I guess there are two things. Um, one is to is really about craft and is I, I you know like I said I needed to learn that I was an outliner and I do write to three act structure and I do write an outline and so um you know and for me the sort of most uh, I'm not really religious or rigorous about particular beats except for the end of the first act and the middle of the second act so those are the things that sort of have to be in place in order for me to know where I'm going um, and so I, I create these kind of, um, I guess, signposts along the way and, and, uh, that are the things that guide me from section to section of the book. Um, and that, that outlining process for me is a kind of, that's the net, you know, that is beneath me as I walk the tightrope of trying to get the book done. So that, that is the way I, that I craft as I'm, I'm navigating that. The other side of it is simply to be to learn to accept the to be comfortable with discomfort. Um, you know, there's that fantastic Ira Glass quote about taste and about how you know the way taste gets in your way as an artist because you develop taste and you have a knowledge of what's good before you're capable of creating good work. And it's tr it's it's I, I, it's a very long quote, but I advise all creative people to seek it out. Um, but I think the sort of extension of that is that. Um, when you are a writer, you are also a reader and you know what good writing is. And so, uh, and you know what you want, you know what the kind of golden version of the book is in your head. And then when you start writing in that first draft, it, certainly there are moments where you feel like a genius and the story is unspooling in front of you and it just feels fantastic. But at least for me, there are long stretches of time where I feel like a fraud where I feel like uh, I'm on the wrong path when I have I'm only consumed by doubt, and that is because, um, especially in the first and second drafts, the book is not good. It is not good. It is th that is the nature of of creating work. It is it is sitting with the discomfort of of creating work that doesn't live up to your expectations. And for me, my books are all about revision and the process of revising to get to the place where the story feels earned and where um, and the characters feel whole. And you get past that kind of like I'm going back to the romance analogy, but you know I always describe the first draft as an awkward first date where you're just every everything well, you know even if there's some magic there, you're like oh god. This is everything is wrong, you know, and you're, oh, uh, what kind of music do you like? Uh, you know, do you have any brothers or sisters? Like, it's just not, and it's, you know, living in that discomfort, I think, was something I did not understand was part of the creative process. And I think that if you are a writer who is struggling with that first book or that second book, um, that it's understanding that, that that is part of it and that it is not a sign that you are failing, but actually a sign that you're trying to do something bigger and better than you've done before is can help to get through that. 
how long does that initial outlining uh, process usually take you? When you have an idea for a book and, and you start sketching it out and getting those those signposts along the road, how long does that part of the process take you? Um, usually it's a pretty fast process. Um, and in fact, it, some people call it fast drafting. Um, so that first, I, the, my, the easiest one to work from for me is Six of Crows, because this was at a point where I was on my fourth book and I was actually talking about process and more aware of it. Um, so Six of Crows, I had written a proposal for. Um, so it was, you know, a few pages of proposal about, you know, basically what was going to happen throughout the book and, uh, you know, some world building stuff and character stuff. And then I sat down to sort of fast draft, um, what would become, I guess what I would call the zero draft or the outline. And that was a process of about two weeks. And, you know, the zero draft of six of crows was about 30,000 words and the final draft of Six of Crows was about 130,000 words. So that for me is sort of the, you know, it's just the musculature of the book. It's a lot of false starts and placeholders and just ideas of what scenes are going to be. And then, you know, some, you know, and here and there, paragraphs and even entire scenes that make it through to the final draft. But, um, you know, that is not, it's not something you would ever want to show anybody. So the sort of initial drafting phase for me usually takes, um, you know, it's, it's pretty fast. Um, and then the building of the book is what is, you know, is really the work of it. Right, right. Uh, let's talk about that first book, uh, Shadow and Bone, uh, which was the first in the, uh, uh, the, the Grisha trilogy, the original. Um, where's I, I hate asking where ideas come from because uh, that's such a trite <laughs> question. But but where did where did these characters in the setting did did uh, it was, was this uh, just an idea you had one day? Is this something you'd been working on for a while? Uh, kind of how did it take shape for you? Um, actually, I, this is one that I can actually pinpoint. Um, I was. I was staying with some friends in the mountains. Um, I used to be, I used to work in makeup and effects. And the thing about working in makeup and effects is that around Halloween, everybody wants to be your best friend. Um, so in order to avoid that and doing a lot of free work, I would um, just leave town. So that's my advice to you is to run away from your problems. But um, I'm, I hold would. On, I'm, I'm writing that down. Yes. Good. Good. I make it into a poster. I feel like I feel like that could be a, like a really powerful quote on Tumblr. Um, so I I had gone to the mountains to stay with some friends, and um, I stayed behind. Everybody went out to dinner, and I stayed behind to read. And I don't remember what book I was reading, um, but I fell asleep. So maybe it's better that I don't remember. But I fell asleep reading it. And while I was, uh, and when I woke up, the, it was completely dark, like, um, you know, like not like city dark, like country dark where you can't see your hand in front of your face. And, um, and I was, I woke up with it, you know, my heart pounding and convinced that something was in the house with me. Um, because as we all know, serial killers wait for you to wake up before they murder you. And, um, and I was sure there was somebody there and I couldn't find the light switches and I felt completely vulnerable and terrified. And, you know, eventually I got over this. Nobody came to murder me and I turned on every light in the house and I looked in every closet and under every bed. And, um, as I sort of got into bed that night, I couldn't get this idea out of my head. This, the fact that, you know, no matter how old we get, this fear of the dark really never goes away. It's always with us. And, um, and the idea of, you know, what if darkness was a place? Uh, in fantasy, darkness usually operates as a metaphor, but what if I gave it concrete physical form? And that idea of this dark territory became the shadow fold. And, and then, you know, I just started thinking, okay, well, what kind of, it's dark, big deal. So what's in there? Well, what if the monsters you imagined there were real? Okay. And what if you had to fight them on their own territory? All right. And then why would you go in there? You know, if there's a dark territory crawling with monsters, maybe stay away from it. So, okay. Oh, first thought, well, well, you know, maybe magical object. No, no, not magical object. Okay. Well, what if it, again, what if we make it literal? What if uh, this is a, a, a thing that has torn this country in two and has isolated it from its coastline so it can't trade? Um, with the outside world, you know, what, how do I, you know, what would that then do to this country? And um, what kind of power created this? And what kind of power would it take to fight this? So that was sort of the first idea uh, that then led to the entire, well, eventually to the whole Grisha verse. The, uh, these books are, are so unique to me in that, 
you know, so much of fantasy uses the the same tropes, and uh, you know, when you a lot of times you could start a new fantasy book and it feels like you've been here before. Mm. Uh, like that, I, I don't want to say uh, that a lot of fantasy is derivative, but a lot of fantasy is derivative. Sure. And, <laughs> well, it is called <laughs> genre, so yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. And uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean one one reason that uh, you know when we we read a lot in the same genre is because it is familiar and there's not a steep learning curve. We can, we can drop in and we kind of, kind of understand the, the mechanics of the world, if you will. Um, these books that you've written have a, a very ethereal quality as maybe the best way I can describe them. Um, uh, you know, with, with some, uh, things taken from kind of modern fantasy stories, some very, uh, uh, you know, historical fantasy. I, I can't quite put it in words. Uh, but what is, what was your inspiration for the specific setting and the 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 set pieces that you use? Um. Well, when I wrote Shadow and Bone in that first zero draft, there was very little in place except for the characters and sort of the the power mechanics of the world, the magical system, and. Um, and sort of the personal and political flow of power. And then it was time to really start thinking about it as a story. And, uh, and it became really clear to me that I had sort of inadvertently already walked into some things that lined up very clearly with Russian history. Um, I had this huge conscripted army of uh, effectively serfs. I had this failure to industrialize, um, uh, this radical division and wealth between rich and poor. And, um, and so I went to Russia and, uh, and uh, sort of other countries in that part of the world as um, my kind of cultural touchstone as the jumping off point for the building of the world. So that first trilogy, which honestly I would say is in, you know, it is a very tropey trilogy. Um, Particularly that first book, it's a very classic hero's journey. It's a chosen one story. Um, but that first trilogy centers largely on Ravka, which was very clearly inspired by Russia of the mid uh, 1800s. And then with Six of Crows, um, you know, I had talked a little bit about Kerch, which was this other country in this world um, when I was working on the trilogy. Um, but I wanted it, you know, it. it I don't know if it was that it was deliberate, but it became a kind of anti-Ravka. This was a country that was this hub of trade and prosperity that had remained neutral in all of these wars and so had been left to prosper. And that had a completely different sort of guiding um, force than, uh, which was, which is largely, you know, capitalism and the Protestant work ethic. And so that, uh, and so I turned to um, early New York and um, and Amsterdam of the 1700s and to a lesser extent Venice and uh, and London as a inspiration for the building of um, this city, Ketterdam, and this country, Kerch. So, um, you know, it. I think there's this point where the story and the setting link up and they really begin to operate as something bigger than the, than their parts. And I think that's what kind of guides me in the cultural inspiration of these stories. In writing Six of Crows, uh, what was uh, what was different about writing that series after you'd finished the first one? And uh, was it uh, were there did you have any um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, well, just uh, was there anything different about writing this series than the first one in the way that you approached it or your process? <sighs> Um, I mean, it was a much harder book to write than any book I'd written before. It's a heist story, you know, and it has uh, five POVs, main POVs in the first book and six in the second book, which I had never done before. Shadow and Bone is very linear. It, aside from the prologue and epilogue, is entirely in a single first-person POV. So this was a very different kind of book for me. Um, but I think that's also why I I think we we set these challenges for ourselves. And... Um, I think it was different for me because in some ways I felt much more sure of myself in terms of things that I wanted to do with world building. I knew that I actively wanted to step away from a chosen one story and really write about characters who were not chosen ones, who were the sort of expendable parts of, of this fantasy world. Um, and I think that was kind of what guided me through that. In, in having, uh, a, 
a story with a different outlook where not a chosen one story, but, but focusing on these other characters. Um, is there a, a difference in the way that you outline these books when you're approaching it from multiple viewpoints and, and how do you balance those? Um, no, I mean, I still am thinking in terms of act structure, in terms of the story. Um, but, and I will say that the writing of the first draft of six of crows was very organic in the way that I was moving from viewpoint to viewpoint, what is unlike a lot of multiple POV stories, this is almost like you're switching camera view. Um, so, uh, because we very rarely are like the stories are not happening in parallel, they're happening, they are sequential. And so when we end one POV, we're picking up with the next POV until they all split at a particular section of the book. Um, so, um, so for me, that was very organic in that first book and was much more challenging in Crooked Kingdom. And right now I'm working on King of Scars, which is um, the first book in the Nikolai Lansov duology. And um, it is a much more, you know, again, we set challenges for ourselves. And this is the first time I'm writing with, you know, multiple storylines happening in tandem. And I wish I could tell you what the process is supposed to be like, but, you know, I'm basically finding my way right now in terms of deciding how um, the beats of these stories are going to work um, within that structure. But I always, I, um, starting with Six of Crows, I started working in Scrivener. Um, I still uh, do the bulk of my drafting and revising in Word, but um, for outlines and structure, I need Scrivener now because I can color code POVs and I'm able to sort of look at the work differently and see the whole story laid out in front of me. So I would say that was sort of the the, the craft change, the tools change that happened for me between um, the Shadow and Bone trilogy and the Six of Crows duology. Um, in in doing the research uh, for a lot of these books and looking at uh, Russian uh, fairy tales and uh, and legends and and you know Eastern European things, were there any things that that surprised you about uh, some of the um, some of the legends and, and cultural things there that differed from the way we as Americans uh, some of the stories we've grown up with. I mean, I can tell you that when you read Russian folk tales and fairy tales, they they resolve in a totally different way than we're used to in kind of Western French German fairy tales. There is, and they feel, I felt to me as a reader unsatisfying. But I think that's because of the way my brain had been trained to expect stories to resolve from childhood. So that was the most fundamental thing. Uh, and there's an ambiguity to those stories that I just don't think exists uh, at, at, in the way that we conclude stories in, in Western fairy tale. Yeah, and, and some of those that, that don't resolve properly as we would think of it uh can be a little unsettling very and, and, unsettling <laughs> you know and you think back man as a little kid <laughs> this is this would give you nightmares you know? I, mean, I mean i we, we like everything to wrap up nicely with a bow at the end we do and i think there's a certain you know this person gets punished this person's the good guy this is how it all ended although when i went back when i was working on the language of thorns and i went back and i was reading some of the source stories you know i can't remember which it is but i want to say it was either sleeping beauty or so, but like in one of the one of the stories where sort of classic fairy tale they get married at the end well then it turns out that the 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 prince's stepmother turns out to be part ogress and like and there's like all, there's sometimes like a second chapter that gets lopped off of the stories as we hear them in our youth and i don't mean like the brutal stuff i just mean there's like an additional part where oh you thought they were safe but no um there was this whole other this whole other journey that they had to go on um so i think it's interesting what gets filtered out or what you know what we retain um culturally year after year, you know, as these stories change. I'll say too, like when I was reading, um, when I was reading a lot of world folk folklore and fairy tales, I also was reading Hans Christian Andersen and Angela Carter and E.T.A. Hoffman. And I, it is really interesting to think about how rarely we create new fairy tales that actually stick. Um, and Hoffman and Andersen are really two of the only people who have managed to do that. Um, who knows what we'll see in the future, but I do, I don't have a, I don't have an answer for why that is, but there are very few stories that have made it into the lexicon the way that, say, the Nutcracker or the Little Mermaid have. In, 
in uh, in studying and and researching these uh, these these early stories, did did they have an effect on the way you approach fiction now, and in the way that that some of these stories don't resolve or you know take twists and turns? Did did that uh, change the way you think about story structure? Um, I don't think it changed the way I think about structure because these stories are. Look, when you're when you're working with the fairy tale form, you are in conversation with kind of all of the form, uh, forms that came before. And that's part of the game you're playing with the reader, right? Oh, here's the stepmother. Here is the neglected younger sister. Here is the monster. Here is the boy who will accomplish three tasks. So you're playing with these tropes and these ideas and the way that the story is supposed to play out. And then you're subverting that in some way. Or you're asking, you know, I, I talk a, a little bit about this in the author's note for The Language of Thorns, but what are the guiding principles for me in these stories was that feeling of discomfort and unease that I think accompanies all fairy tales. And I think that we, in order to experience the pleasure of fairy tales, the wish fulfillment of them, <clears throat> we're kind of forced to lead all of the things that give us discomfort. So we we some we psychologically skip over the fact that, you know, in Hansel and Gretel, this weak-willed man allows his children to be sent away, and that it is somehow acceptable for them to return to them him at the end because his evil wife has been vanquished. Never mind the fact that he's the one who let this happen or that he could marry some evil lady from two doors down the next week. You know, this is somehow supposed to give us a feeling of comfort at the end. And for me as a child, even I felt panicked by the idea of them returning to what is clearly not a safe place for them to be. I was sort of like, y'all, you know, there's gotta be another village on the other side of the woods. Maybe go there instead. Um, but also the discomfort of things like love at first sight that we don't fundamentally believe in or the idea that the way we choose the person we love is through a series of impossible tasks. You know, that this is somehow the way that you show that you're a good person or a worthy person. Um, and I think that that discomfort exists for all of us and we learn to sort of skip over it and just enjoy the pleasure of the tale. But when I was working towards the language of thorns, I wanted to actually go as deeply as possible into those moments of unease as I could. Uh, speaking of the language of thorns, uh, this new collection that, that I was gushing over uh, when we first started talking. Bless um, you. Well, you know, it's the truth. Um, where did, where did this collection come from? Because this is a, a collection of, of short stories uh, based in, in your world. And uh First off, whose idea was it to put together this collection, and how did this gorgeous volume uh, come about with all of the magnificent illustrations and and all of the great packaging? Um, well, for, okay, so the the people who made this book so beautiful are um, the people at Imprint, which is my Imprint is called Imprint at uh, at uh, Macmillan Children's Books, and um, the reason this book is beautiful is because of my editor Aaron Stein. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Natalie Souza, uh, who is the art director there, um, Ellen Duda, who worked extensively on the internal art for the book and the cover, um, and Sarah Kippen, who was the illustrator um, who who created all of these beautiful illustrations. The idea, for, I mean, the the book has art on every single page and that art progresses through the story. And that idea really came from imprint. That was not me. They brought me this idea and I said, well, it sounds cool, but I don't know if y'all can pull it off. And it wasn't, and really I, di I didn't know if it would work. And then I saw the initial illustrations and I was just completely blown away. And doing that meant that there were other challenges for it, challenges in terms of layout and editorial and challenges. And we, we couldn't do full color printing if we were going to do this. So we had to work with three colors of, um, a three color palette. And it is incredible to me to look at that book and understand that it was done with three colors. Like it is just mind blowing. Um, and the cover and the case are just, it, they poured so much love and creativity into, again, what, what you know, short stories are always a gamble, I guess, unless you're Neil Gaiman, they're always a, a gamble. And, um, and so I felt, I, 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 I felt just incredibly grateful to them for wanting to the wanting to roll the dice with me, essentially that we were saying, all right, we're going to just going to do this. Um, and so that is why the book is, is beautiful. I wish I could take credit for it, but I cannot. Um, and, but the stories themselves, I wrote the, I did write the, Oh, words, stories, the, the words, right. into. um, 
yeah, so this began back in uh, around 2011, I guess. Um, I had the chance to write a story for Tor.com, and that story was The Witch of Duva, which was this um, Hansel and Gretel retelling. Um, and they had originally approached me about sort of doing a promotional story for Shadow and Bone that would be a prequel, but that really didn't fit for what I wanted to do with the books. And I'd had this idea kind of... Uh, in the back of my head for a very long time, because as I told you, this story had never quite sat with me. So that was the first of these stories. And then I ended up writing um, Too Clever Fox uh, for the release of Siege and Storm and Little Knife for the release of Ruin and Rising. And, um, you know, and I had said kind of early on to, to my agent and to some writing partners that, you know, I would really like to do a collection of these i'd love to do an illustrated collection but um it's an expensive proposition and it again it's not like a, a novel or a book in a series where you sort of know that readers are going to come along for the journey you're sort of asking them to take a leap with you so that was the the history of the book uh, in the the writing the the short stories that are connected to the other stories uh but is your writing process when approaching them different uh than your novels I I don't outline them. I don't outline my short stories. Um, they're you're not the you're not the first person who said that that, oh. that like uh, like when when approaching short stories it's it's like all the rules are off the table uh, for for a lot of writers. That's it's really strange. That's reassuring to hear. Um, yeah, you know, I, I for me there's this kind of so I keep a and I, like I'm sure many writers keep an idea file these sort of bits and pieces of ideas that come to you as you're falling off to sleep at night. And, um, and when I was working on these stories, I sort of went back to the idea file to see what was there. Um, I also, when I was, I just went and read a ton of, um, of folk and fairy tales and writing about folk and fairy tales and sort of saw what emerged and what ideas came to me and, and didn't really constrain myself in terms of being like, oh, great, I'm going to buckle down and research. It was, I'm going to see what emerges from the experience of reading <clears throat> these stories. Um, and when I tell the tales, I usually, I mean, I can tell you when I wrote The Witch of Duba, I actually was, I just sort of sat in my bathtub and I in my storyteller voice just started with the opening line, you know, there was a time uh, when the woods near Duvay ate girls. And uh, for me, it usually begins with a first line or a first image. And I just tell the story to myself from there. Um, I tell you that the last in the book, which I think is actually novella length, it's called When Water Sang Fire. And it's a bit different from the other stories in the book. It's uh, much longer. It required a lot more work in terms of magical systems and world building. And that one, I actually went back sort of when I was in the woods with it um, and, and outlined it after the fact to sort of see where the major story beats were because it had gotten long enough that I just couldn't hold it in state anymore. <clears throat> And then uh, you also have another book that uh, is uh, that is pretty new. It's been out uh, about a <clears throat> month and a half or two months now, and it it seems like a perfect natural progression from your Grishaverse uh, books. <laughs> and it's a uh, Wonder Woman Warbringer. Um, w when I saw this book coming out, um, I got really excited, and uh, it, it is a fantastic read. Thank but it you. is so different uh, from your other stuff. Um, First, what brought you to this project, and what was it like? What was it like writing such an iconic character with such a rich history, and uh, and getting to play in this world? Um, you know, it was a great honor and a great joy, and also a pain in the ass. Like that's <laughs> that's the nature of contending with something this big, um, and with this many cooks in the kitchen. I am um, so gosh, it was a long time ago. Now it was back in uh, twenty the start of 2015, I think, I got a, maybe it's not that long ago, writing time is like this, I sometimes feel like it's like you're a teenager again, and everything is semesters, but instead it's release dates. Um, and, and it's a little bit like dog years, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the novel years, dog years, same thing. And that is why I feel so old. Um, so I think it was back early 2015, maybe the end of 2014, and um, my agent got a call from Random House, and they said, we can't tell you who the characters are, but we are going to be working with DC, 
And we're going to do a series of YA novels called DC Icons about these characters. And um, and so my agent called me, told me that she said, you know, they're being very mysterious about it. And I said, well, it's Wonder Woman, yes. And if it's anybody else, no. Um, so that worked out well because it was, in fact, Wonder Woman was on the slate. And I had um, written an essay for a book called Last Night a Superhero Saved My Life. And it was about Wonder Woman and about... Uh, and I had sort of done a deep dive on it. I had only approached it as a critical essay. And so I had done a deep dive into her canon and also um, her creation and her cultural impact. And so I I felt like I had a good handle on the character already in terms of research. And I think we sent this essay and it sort of told them the kind of story that I wanted to write um, and how I viewed the character. So that was kind of my audition for the gig. Um, and then we went from there. At the time uh, that you kind of signed up for this project, there was probably no way to know that the Wonder Woman movie uh, was going to be the hit that it was. Uh, was uh, it? No. And if, like, if anything, we were all holding her. Like, I, I don't think anybody expected it. I think all of us who were Wonder Woman fans approached that film with sort of cautious optimism. Um, but no, abs- there was none of us were counting on it being a success. And I also knew nothing. They would not tell me anything about the film as I approached the book. Um, They viewed it as a completely different universe, which is sort of a a quirk of DC. I think Marvel tries to keep greater control over sort of what's happening in canon at a given time. But if you look at this year, there are, I think, four different, at least four different takes. I've been counting, you know, what's happening in animation um, on a woman canon. So um, I think it can be a little different for people who are new her to approach um, but yeah, I knew nothing about the film. So I, we screened it at BookCon and the first time I saw it and it was definitely surprising on some levels, but, um, yeah, it, I had no idea that it would be as successful as it has been at all. <clears throat> Comic fans and, uh, fans of, of these iconic characters, uh, are, uh, can be opinionated, uh, you don't and say. can be, yeah, yeah, well, um, it's just something I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could, could be very loyal to their characters. They want them to be, uh, a, a very particular way. Um, your other books, you are in complete control of that universe. Um, what, what has the fan reaction been to the Wonder Woman book? And has it been different from the reaction that you get from people who enjoy your other books? Um, Yes, I mean, it is, it's been very strange. I mean, we knew, I knew going in, I had to kind of let go of what people's expectations were going to be because I knew it would be people who love the comics who would say the book wasn't enough like the comics and, and, or who would love particular parts of the comics, right? Particular, they who want to see a particular thing. I mean, I remember reading a review and somebody saying, I want something more like Frank Miller. And I was like, well, then you came to the wrong damn place, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the I, I knew fans of Six of Crows and fans of the Grisha novels might come to the book and say, oh, this isn't enough like Six of Crows. And people who loved the movie might say it's not like the movie, not enough like the movie. People hated the movie might say, oh, it's too much like the movie. You know, so that, that we're, I knew there were too many choruses of voices and I really had to sort of shut them all down. Um, I, you know, the response by and large has been really great response from people that I respect. Um, there's a beautiful review from Charlie Jane Anders and a beautiful review from um, Brittany at Black Nerd Problems. And um, seeing reviews from people who know Wonder Woman canon, sometimes, you know, when they tell me I got it right, that does mean a lot to me. Um, but I think for me, the most important thing was I wanted this to be a story that centered entirely on women and on female friendship. Um, I really did not care about Steve Trevor. I never have. Chris Pine is a delightful man and did a wonderful job. I thought his character was well written. I thought he was great. I was uh, unexpectedly charmed by him, but I don't, I, there's nothing that can make me care about Steve Trevor. Um, but he met his appropriate demise. You know, and you know, I mean, <laughs> I, you said it, not me, but um, I, th- that just has never been the most satisfying part of the Wonder Woman story for me. And, uh, and so that's not what I wanted to write. I wanted to write about um, her coming to our world and meeting a teenage girl. And I knew that some people would be looking for something grittier or edgier or sexier. And I really wanted to write a story about um, somebody becoming a hero. And um, I wanted to write about Diana. I wanted it to be as I wanted to take my put, place my own stamp on Amazon mythology because um, I had my own ideas about uh, how I wanted the island to work. And 
Um, and I wanted her to come to the modern world because I think we have problems in the modern world that her particular lens could, you know, show in a, in a funny and horrible way. Um, and that was, that was the way I wanted to engage with the story. Um, a funny and, and horrible way is, uh, I, I love that you said that, uh, because, uh, you know, in so much, uh, serious fiction or, or dark fiction or, you know, really heavy fiction, um, one of the most important things is, uh, to bring a little levity in there. Um, is, is that something that you try to do in all of your work? And, uh, uh, and, and is, you know, is that something important to, uh, to kind of let the reader take a breather every now and then? Oh, yeah. I don't, I look, this is the way that I deal with stress and always have is, is to, to laugh about it. And I don't know if, you know, and I think that's also people say that's a particular part of Jewish culture, you know, but I think it's also that, especially given the times we're living in, that, um, on, you have to be able to have those moments where, um, you step back and, and laugh or, or that's how you deal with that anxiety or stress. Um, so that is, I think, always woven into my work. And I think as I've gotten more comfortable as a writer and uh, more confident as a writer, that humor has has been more prominent uh, in the way that I write. I'm also sometimes surprised when people, like people will say that Kaz is very funny or that he's, you know, they'll be like, oh, he's so sassy. And I'm like, really? Because I don't think Kaz thinks of himself as funny at all. And I think I'm so deeply into his head. I just thought he was you know, he was just being Kaz. So I think that, um, I don't know. I, I am, I really enjoy writing humor. Um, and that's, I think always going to be a part of my stories and there are very few stories. And even in the language of thorns, it creeps its way in. And I think that wonder woman is sort of the most sort of rollicking adventure story I've written. It's a, in some ways younger than some of the other YA I've written. Um, it's very much a quest narrative and it's, um, you know, and I, I don't know, I feel like I was free to be punchy in a way that I haven't necessarily been punchy in my other stories. <laughs> the snark is strong. The snark and, uh, is strong. Yeah. yeah. And we love it. We love it. Um, Lee, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh. If, uh, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they find you online? You can find me at leebardugo.com. Um, if you're interested in my Grishaverse books, that's a much fancier website, Grishaverse.com. And if you want to find me on social, I'm about to take a good long hiatus from Twitter. But my Twitter, my Instagram, my Tumblr, all of that is L Bardugo. Just L, not, you know, the initial, not like El Bardugo. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for the great chat. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Father and I met the train on the morning of Halloween. As the engine of the New York Railroad arrived, I could feel Brahms' tension. He searched the crowd, looking for his old rival. He pointed at a man approaching silhouetted by a curtain of steam, swinging a black valise with a bronze clasp. That's Ichabod! The man was in all particulars exactly what I expected, lean and exceedingly lank, with a snipe nose and hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves. Yet as the man's face swam into view, I could see that he was about the same age as I, only thirty or so. Do I have the honor of addressing Master Van Brunt? You do, sir said father. The man bowed. Absalom Crane, at your service. Brom extended a hand. You are Ichabod's son? You gave me a fright. You look so much as your father did. Is he with you? Absalom shook his head. My father died late last year, over the Christmas holiday. Brom saddened but clapped Absalom's back, saying, Then you may call me father. The two walked on, arm in arm, and I carried Absalom's bag. That evening all twenty-four acres of Sunnyside were resplendent with good cheer. Paper lanterns lit the path. Bonfires blazed in the outlying fields, and the villagers danced as if at Sabbath. 
The people of Terrytown roasted apples or marshmallows and drank cider by the barrelful. Tables groaned, heavy with turkey and ham and pumpkin pie and pumpkin bread and pumpkin puddings and hot Indian puddings of molasses and cornmeal. After the feast, I took Absalom aside, stepping into Mr. Irving's reading room. I do not remember how the conversation began. I was red-faced with liquor. I had been attempting to impress him with the Van Brunt wealth. The competitive urge had risen in me. I intimated that rural Bridgeport must be a backwater, and he, the country bumpkin, must be quite starry-eyed. I am comfortable enough, said Absalom. My father left me some honest gold. I could not let that pass. Honest gold? I pressed. I am most curious to know what is meant by honest gold. If Mr. Irving is to be believed, the Van Tassel fortune was won by your father's trickery. Else it should have been taken by my father, along with your mother's hand. Katrina was too far above Ichabod. That is not his version of the tale, said Absalom with a knowing look. You insult my mother. You insult my father. Now let me pass. I've no wish to fight you. You're a coward, then. Absalom brushed past me. I fumed and would have set all of Mr. Irving's manuscripts afire had I not governed myself. I found Absalom in the parlor by the fireplace. Irving had encouraged his guests to reenact the famous Van Tassel party of the legend and tell ghost stories. The brandy poured freely, the men smoked, and the chestnut tails of the region were trotted out one by one in parade. The White Lady of Raven Rock, the ghost of poor Major André, hanged from the tulip tree aside the post road, and, of course, the headless horseman. Did you ride that night, Brom? asked young Joseph Martling. Was it you that affrighted the schoolteacher? Brom sat, and all eyes were on him. Whatever the truth, I hope his son will forgive my part in it. There's nothing to forgive, said the son of Ichabod. It's a grand work, Mr. Irving, a grand fiction. On the mantel, a bronze clock chimed eleven. Tis almost the witching hour, said Irving. Time for all children to be abed, lest they be caught on the road. I would not be caught dead on the road tonight, said Martling, who lived nearby. Why not, said I. Let us ride Ichabod's route back to Beekmantown in commemoration. The young men cheered the idea. I turned to Absalom. Would you join us? No. It's absurd. The sleepy hollow boys jeered at him. Absalom sighed. Very well, then. We will ride together as a group. The gloom that found us on the road was terrible. In those days no gas lights lit the post road and the way from Roost to the bridge crossing still wound past Wildy Swamp, fearfully black at that hour. I watched Absalom riding to my left. He was a thin, spectral thing in the moonlight. Idle talk died on our lips, and our small band rode with only the sound of horse hooves for accompaniment. There it is whispered Martling. The hanging tree. The old tulip tree twisted against the starry sky. The road broke to either side of it. Absalom and I passed to the left, nearer the black brook. That is where your father is said to have first seen the thing. My companion had slowed, gazing fearfully at the branches above. I saw something, he whispered. I saw a body swinging from the tree. Come now, Absalom. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? Hurry up, then. Quick, before the horseman rides. You can't reason with a headless man. As if on cue, a wind rose. Branches tore and leaves swept the air. A terrible cracking laugh rose all around. Eyes opened and watched us from the deep. The faces of spirits appeared. Horrors rose from the Andre Brook. Our horses whinnied and reared. Absalom grabbed my arm and pointed. The horseman stood on the slope above. 
he raised his hatchet. His army of ghosts fell upon us. My horse and I turned circles, terrorized and confused. Young Martling shouted, We have to make the bridge, and rode off. Make the bridge, cried the others as one, and our companions scattered, tearing up the post road with a clatter of frantic hooves. Make the bridge! The horseman gathered his form and lunged at Absalom. Young Crane dodged the blade, dug heels into the flanks of his steed, and fled. Cries of, Make the bridge! echoed all around. Where? cried Absalom, galloping into the swamp, his voice distant and small. Where is the bridge? Someone tell me! Help! He was gone before I could answer. Yet what could I have said? The bridge of legend is gone, torn down. It shall never be crossed again. I watched Absalom splash into Wildy Swamp, the horseman in pursuit, and I knew what his fate would be.